First of all, we're going to have a presentation uh, from Davina Toja, who's going to be joining us virtually from Brussels. Um, and the topic of that paper is also on the scenarios. The title of the paper is The Western Balkans EU Accession Perspective After the War in Ukraine. After the presentation, uh, each panelist is going to have five minutes of their opening remarks and maybe some reflections on the key findings of the paper. And then, of course, I'm going to take full advantage of my position as a moderator. I'm going to be asking a few questions to uh, the panelists. And after that, we will open the floor for uh, the audience for any comments or questions you might have. So without further ado, uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, Labinot on uh, Zoom. I think, every Labinot, can you hear us? I can absolutely hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, that, that's great. Yeah, I can hear you very well. Um, so, Labinot, if you uh, could please uh, present the main points. I know your paper is uh, a bit long, but we'll try to squeeze in uh, the most important information in, in 10 minutes. So, Labinot, the floor is yours. Well, uh, long or short, depends. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we can, we can be happy that it was long and not just a paragraph, because that means that there is something to talk about. Uh, in any case, uh, I want to, to just, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I want to congratulate the organizers on this uh, new initiative. Uh, it's great to see that Kosovo is part of these regional conversations and that Kosovo is host to these regional conversations uh, about uh, democracy and peace. Uh, one of the things that I would want to wish this new initiative is that it becomes irrelevant uh, as soon as possible. That means that it will have fulfilled its headline. Uh, of achieving peace and democracy uh, fully in, in the Balkans. Um, well, uh, as you said, I'm here to present the brief, which is uh, recently finalized that uh, is to be published by Spunker. Uh, I want to thank Spunker for allowing me to, 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 to write this paper as well uh, as part of its uh, democracy hub supported by Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Just as a background, when I took uh, up this uh, assignment, it was meant more as um, an exercise to engage in the findings of the uh, conference on the future of Europe. But uh, with time, and as I was engaged in writing it, uh, there was another event which has uh, even more profoundly impacted the way that the enlargement is being seen, and that is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, whichever that event it is, um, the EU's own internal discussion about uh, decision-making as it relates to the enlargement process or the actual uh, war in Ukraine, we can see that uh, lately we've had a little bit more reinvigorated uh, discussion on enlargement and the Western Balkans, as well as the Eastern Partnership countries in the EU than we have seen before. We've had, as we all know, a very long uh, period of stagnation uh, in some uh, countries' decades uh, uh, in their process. Now, I don't want to completely spoil the reading of, of, of the paper, but uh, I just want to bring a few points. The basic premise is that the EU enlargement process is mainly a political process, regardless how much the European Commission and some would like to present it as a technical process with just objectively verifiable accession criteria. The latest events around the upgrade of the perspective of some of the Eastern Partnership countries in no uncertain terms illustrate this. Given this, the paper also argues that uh, EU's enlargement it's, uh, in its immediate neighborhood is a geostrategic imperative that require, requires a greater sense of urgency than it has been given, at least in the last decade. The question, of course, always remains, how do we get there? Um, the best uh, guaranteed way, of course, is for the countries to fulfill the well-known Copenhagen criteria to adhere to European principles and standards, but uh, there are ways that can help this uh, go along. These ideas have been talked about both in the region and uh, in the EU for a very long time now. The question is whether this is a good time to, to, to apply them. One of them is, of course, uh, the uh, broader application of qualified majority voting, moving away from unanimity. This um, uh, long-standing internal debate in the EU uh, has not produced much as of yet. However, uh, as we just saw a few days ago at the State of the uh, European Union address of the President of the Commission, there is now a real push for uh, a Convention on Reform, which in itself would uh, also contain um, uh, issues related to, to, to uh, changing the way that uh, the EU takes decision on uh, certain matters. 
but uh, even just yesterday here, here in Brussels, uh, we've had uh, the General Affairs Council where the member states discussed uh, both the issue of the Convention on Reform, but also decision making and moving away from unanimity, given the, 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 the decision making that needs to be taken in terms of uh, foreign policy, uh, namely uh, sanctions on Russia and so forth. Um, whatever the outcome of these conversations will be, uh, uh, it's very clear that uh, it might end up being a very long process. Uh, and one that will not necessarily match the expectations for integration of the Western Balkan countries. Um, the other issue there to consider is uh, even if this happens, uh, would it actually have any practical implication? Because as we know, even in the areas of uh, uh, majority voting, non-unanimous uh, voting, uh, the EU hesitates to put uh, member states in the corner and uh, take decisions. So, in, in, in important questions, it's, it's questionable. Uh, the second idea that uh, I touch upon is the uh, idea of the staged accession. This is something, again, that uh, uh, there is a, a long-standing debate uh, in, uh, in, in the region as well now, lately. Um, uh, most uh, vividly, it has come up uh, in the idea of President Macron around the European political community. On 6th of October, there will be a first meeting in Prague, which will bring together leaders of EU, Ukraine, UK, Norway, Switzerland, including the Western Balkans. Um, in the Western Balkans, though, when there, where there is a membership perspective, at least on paper, we need to approach this idea, I think, very carefully. We don't want to get ourselves necessarily wrapped in something that uh, could be a substitute for what it is, what, we, what we've had until now. If the objective of the countries is complete, and full membership would a midway step of increased cooperation with uh, uh, help these countries to get uh, where they want to be, or would be the, would this be the new final destination? I fear it could be in a, in, in a way acceptance of a defeat or even a way to solidify the status quo. And uh, finally, uh, what I present is the block accession, which. Um, which uh, has been done uh, before, of course, before Croatia joined uh, in 2013 alone. Uh, the main case for block accession is that the EU itself is a regional uh, organization whose main purpose is to deepen and institutionalize uh, regional interstate cooperation in Europe. In a region like the Western Balkans, where we've had um, wars just um, over two decades ago, the emphasis on regional cooperation and integration should presumably be the absolute focus of the enlargement process. And um, it should be, in a way, done for it uh, to be mutually supported. Now, this is, as we know, part of the SAAs and the, and the requirements that the countries have, the regional cooperation, good neighborly relations, and so on. But uh, there is, at the same time, uh, ongoing at a practical level, some sort of uh, practice of promotion of internal competition through things like uh, uh, promoting front runners and so on. Even in, the, in terms of assistance, we've seen the shaping of the EPA for 2021 to 2027 to be awarded through a competitive uh, process where more mature and more advanced uh, projects will be rewarded. So that uh, means that there will be always someone uh, left behind. Um, and uh, in this context, I also present the fact that uh, uh, the six countries together could be a more attractive opportunity for the EU in terms of a single re uh, as a single region and, and the market. Uh, having them all join at once solves also the problem of um, uh, blocking each other in the future. Uh, finally, I don't want to give away the, the punchline of, uh, of, of, of my uh, uh, paper by reading out the conclusion, but uh, it's, uh, it just goes uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the line of uh, reinforcing that the integration of the Western Balkans is ultimately a political decision and that there are ways to make it a reality uh, if there's a will. And our, I argue that there should be a will. Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine has illustrated how European continent is uh, very much linked. A lasting peace can only be realized if uh, this interdependence is actively pursued and ensured. String the Western Balkans, um, along with promises, vague promises of European paths, um, in the new reality that was uh, created, I don't think uh, we'll uh, cut it anymore.
So uh, with this, I would like to thank you and uh, wish you a good continuation of, uh, of, the, of the conference. Thank you so much, uh, Lovinot. Um, just uh, for the sake of the discussion, I'm just going to repeat your three main scenarios um, so that you can generate uh, more discussion. So the first one, you mentioned majority decision making or qualified majority mo moving away from unanimity. And the second one, membership in stages as uh, introduced or proposed by the French President Emmanuel Macron as the European political community. And the third one, uh, revisiting block accession as it has happened uh, before. Um, so uh, now uh, we can turn to our panelists. Uh, I'd like to um, give the floor to Odeta Barbulushi, who's the uh, advisor to the Albanian Prime Minister Dirama. Odeta, uh, uh, how do you foresee the future of uh, the integration? We've seen that uh, Albania and North Macedonia opened their, uh, finally opened their negotiation uh, uh, accession talks. And this is a remarkable achievement for the both countries, even though it came after so many years of delay. How do, how do you see the future of EU integration? And uh, what are your reflections on, on, on uh, the paper or the key points that Labinot presented? Odeva? Well, thank you. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers, uh, Espunker, the Kosovo Center for Security, and the other partners for inviting me. It's always a pleasure when I come back to Pristina, and particularly to be part of this conversation. Um, which brings together policymakers and civil society. I think this is a very important forum to discuss the future of accession, but also the future of the dialogue and of the region. And uh, with honest, all honesty, I'm very glad that this time we're not discussing about the date of accession uh, talks, of opening the accession talks. It's the first time we can actually start the discussion by uh, envisaging the future, how the future will will look. And uh, I'll start with a, I think, very widely accepted assumption that uh, the current moment, the crisis in Ukraine has been a watershed moment for European security, as it was said here before, uh, previously by Agon and other speakers, but it has also been a moment of reflection for, Europe, for, for EU enlargement uh, policy. Because I think for all Europeans, it has become clear that enlargement policy is a policy for the transformation of other European countries, but it's also an instrument of peace and stability, particularly of peace in, in the in continent. And of course, we have the moment of offering the candidate status of, to Ukraine and Moldova as a demonstration of that uh, realization of that reflection. Um, the opening of accession negotiations of Albania and North Macedonia uh, aren't in fact a consequence of that, but like you said, are a result of a long delayed uh, uh, process. But it's important to see the opening of accession uh, talks with Albania and North Macedonia in the current moment, even though, I would, like I said, they are not caused or they are not a direct effect of, of the crisis. These were processes uh, uh, waited for a long time and indeed, uh, I would also say uh, widely shared uh, uh, assumption in the region that a lot of precious time was lost, has been lost, particularly since 2018 onward. We had the press agreement, we had a council decision to open the negotiation to 2020, um, and then two more years uh, to open the negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. Uh, so we had a, a, a few years lost, which I think um, have eroded the trust. So when we think about now the future of accession processes, how to recover that trust and how to have a meaningful conversation about the future between the European Union and the Western Balkans. And I think for the moment, there are two conversations taking place. And uh, the one conversation is about the future of the EU, the internal rules, how the voting uh, rules can change, may change to make, to, to make the union more effective and that would have a direct uh, impact also on the enlargement process in opening the new class chapter clusters for, uh, for the candidate countries so on. Uh, how to strengthen the European Union as a strategic security actor in global scene. And that discussion is very, uh, is very important in the current uh, uh, security context uh, because of the Ukraine crisis uh, war. Um, the debate about the EU strategic autonomy, a discussion we have seen for the past uh, 
for the past few years. That is one debate. The other debate is more explicitly linked to the region, how to bring the region closer to uh, the EU, to the single market, how we can bring uh, the region closer to certain policy areas which are of strategic importance for the social and economic transformation of these countries, uh, like the energy, um, food security, agriculture, but also innovation, uh, higher education, and so on. And these are two interlinked but separate debates. And I think what we hear in the capitals, in Brussels, in EU capitals, and in the region, we are talking about the same word, we are using the same terminology, we are using the same themes, so to speak, of discussing, but I think we have different needs. And I think it's very important to send this message to have this conversation between the EU and the region, what the region uh, needs for the moment. And I think uh, in this connection, there are two important uh, arguments to be made in this particular moment both by policymakers and also civil society and those working uh, on, on, on public policy and new affairs. One is um, whether this debate can actually have uh, uh, concrete, can have tangible uh, results, can have, uh, um, can change in effectiveness um, the, the way that enlargement process, accession process uh, uh, continues. And I'm a bit realistic in that. I wouldn't say pessimistic. I think uh, going back to the three scenarios as you were presented uh, here, I don't think the current moment or the current debate will change much in the accession process as it is. But at the same time, what I think is important uh, for us is how to be at the table with the European Union, with the EU, and how to uh, engage meaningfully uh, in policy discussions about the areas that I mentioned, about the energy, like food security, innovation research. Um, and not much of this debate or some of the solutions that we have been, or some of the options and alternatives we have discussed in the region require the opening of the treaties, treaties or internal reform of the EU. But I think a lot of those, many of those alternatives have to do or uh, need political will on the part of, uh, of, of, of the EU to engage meaningfully with, uh, with the Western Balkans of what the Western Balkans needs. Um, a second thing which I think is, or a message which is also very important is uh, how we can use regional cooperation of what we do in the region particularly economic cooperation as an instrument for phasing in, which was the second scenario presented here in, in the paper. Uh, and this discussion on phasing in started, in fact, since we started working on in 2017 with an action plan on common regional market. And we are also working in different platforms in the region trilaterally, bilaterally of how everything we do on the economic cooperation front contributes to bringing us closer to the single market. And I think that is, that is very important. Um, the, third, uh, the third message, I think, has to do with, uh, with the mindsets of, uh, of the Europeans and of the European Union. Um, and I remember when, there were, when the debate about the Conference of the Future of Europe started, whether the Western Balkans would be part of this uh, conference or not. Um, and of course, our, our argument was that we need to be part of it because even if we are not at the present we, inside the European Union, we'll be in the future. So we need to be part of that debate now. There is a reflection, like I said at the beginning, both by uh, some member states like France, like Germany, but also others about this. And uh, now in the upcoming uh, conference on the European political uh, community, uh, in Prague in October, uh, Western Balkan countries will be invited, but the important uh, uh, message is to come out of that conference with, with tangible options and alternatives. Hmm? How the Western Balkans can be made part of joint mechanisms to mitigate, uh, to mitigate the crisis, uh, for example, um, and how they can contribute more meaningfully to, to European security. I think this is more important than just having another summit 
uh, and just having another union of, of leaders of the countries, even though that is important in itself for, uh, for more enhanced dialogue and engagement between the EU and, and the Western Balkans. I'll leave it there and I can elaborate more perhaps in response to your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Serjan. Uh, Serjan, you, you've been uh, working on this uh, in, in the Serbian government and uh, you've been directly engaged uh, in, in, in negotiation, the chapters, and I'd like to get your perspective. Uh, even though it, it sounds like a, a remarkable achievement, but there's been a lot of delays. If it took uh, a country in Central and Eastern Europe, eight to nine years on average, to be fully integrated into the bloc. Uh, Macedonia, for example, has, has opened the, uh, uh, has applied in 2004, even before Croatia, and still waiting. It needs to change all uh, history books and, and, and the flag and the name and, uh, and all of that. Do you think we're going to, do you anticipate issues like this in, in the future? How, how, how do you for, uh, foresee the, the future of the EU integration? And if you get to upon the scenarios as well, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, Lizar. And uh, it's it's great to be in Pristina to see so many friendly faces uh, around in this uh, room. Um, I want to thank the organizers and all of those who supported them. I think this is uh, just the first in line, as as you said, Agon. Hope that this is going to to become a traditional get together of people who are thinking much in a much broader. Uh, perspective about the region and about uh, the particular uh, issues that we are dealing with for the benefit of the of the citizens. Um, and I want to also thank Labinot for, for his paper, which is a, a very, uh, very good contribution to our discussion. And uh, a special thanks goes to, to those who created this agenda and put the EU integration process as the first topic of, uh, of the agenda. I know that Maybe some of you are going to pay much more attention to the dialogue issues, uh, but I uh, strongly believe that the dialogue uh, perspective of this dialogue uh, is uh, extremely dependent on the European uh, framework within which uh, this is taking place. And thus, uh, uh, on behalf of us who are a diehard Euro, uh, Euro enthusiast in the region, it's not very, um, how to put it, uh, a custom these days that you can talk about European integration uh, perspective uh, in general in, uh, in uh, gatherings like this. So uh, special thanks goes to, to those who created the agenda and put this uh, uh, in, in, a, in a central point of uh, important discussions that uh, we are going to witness during, uh, during the day. Um, on perspective of the enlargement, um, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, uh, the, the president of the European Commission, uh, Ms. von der Leyen, said that um, the EU is not going to be completed and that uh, she's looking forward to a common uh, future in our union, speaking about the Western Balkans and about the candidate states. And this is a, exactly the kind of a emotional message that we are requiring this time. Uh, this is a message that speaks to a broader public, public, and this is a message which I guess is an attempt to uh, re-energize the policy which is currently being um, in a crisis. We have to be honest. Uh, and although we witnessed the start of the accession talks with North Macedonia and Albania, which is of course very uh, much welcome, or, or, although belated, um, uh, uh, um, thing to, to, to happen. And although we witnessed the uh, Ukraine and Moldova and even conditionally Georgia getting the uh, candidacy status for the accession to the EU, it seems that regardless of this situation, we don't know how to move forward. And this is what uh, I think Odetta said, uh, there is an important question of how to, to move on, how to, how to get to the goal which is uh, being widely described, rightfully so, as a strategic common interest of both the EU and the Western Balkans. And I, I wrote a small blog for uh, European Policy Center uh, uh, website on Monday, uh, where I said there are two ways to continue. One is to continue business as usual, um, stucking our heads in the sand, uh, believing that the process as it is will develop and finally deliver some results, uh, which uh, 
is, uh, I would say, not that um, uh, uh, likely because the EU, in, the EU enlargement process has vastly lost its transformative power to, to influence basically the transformation within the candidate sta sta uh, uh, countries. Uh, but there is a, a different way to go, and this is to um, agree on some sort of a general consensus about the integration of Europe. And basically to make sure that these two conversations that uh, Odetta mentioned are becoming a one conversation of a common integration of Europe um, in, the, uh, in the future, which will define a clear measures and very concrete uh, uh, things that needs to be uh, fulfilled, both on the side of candidate countries to feel, fulfill all the required requirements for the membership, but also for the EU itself to resolve its own internal uh, internal issues. And I call this uh, a, a sort of a new pan-European deal, uh, a common agenda for integration of Europe 2030. And I know that mentioning dates is not the most um, uh, appreciated exercise these days, but we are here to break the taboos. And I think that one of the taboos is to start talking about the date, because, because without a time oh. framework, it is, and we witnessed so in the case of North Macedonia, in the case of Serbia, in the case of Montenegro, it's very difficult to project the required reforms that needs to be performed if there is a no time, at least uh, uh, indicative time frame uh, for, for its uh, implementation. Um, now, what this common agenda, similar to the agenda 2000, and mind you, and remember, nobody joined the EU in 2000. But there was an agenda which said who needs to do what in which frame of time. And this is why I'm really advocating for start talking about the 2030. And it falls neatly into, into some other plans which, which were circulated these days throughout the media, which says that in the EU is going to be ready to enlarge in the next uh, 10 years. So if country wants to join the EU in 20, I don't know, uh, uh, 2033, by 2030, it will have to deliver because it takes at least two, two years to finalize the ratification process, uh, ratification of the accession agreement process uh, in, uh, in member states. Uh, and I didn't know about these other, other plans when I was writing my article, so there is no conspiracy behind it <laughs> uh, at all. So why do we need this? Uh, common agenda for integration of Europe, because, as I said, the EU needs to deliver and to change its rules of procedure, as uh, Labinot said, and as uh, Odetta was saying. Um, if we are talking about strategic autonomy, if we are talking about strategic importance of the enlargement, it is not natural that single member state can jeopardize the strategic autonomy and strategic vision of the EU because of some sort of a irrational nationalistic or populist bilateral issues that um, it has with some of the, the candidate countries. I'm not going to name uh, anyone you all know <laughs> whom I'm uh, referring to. So the qualified majority uh, voting system, as in the case of common foreign security policy in all the other strategic policy areas, and I believe strongly that enlargement policy is a strategic policy of the EU needs to be uh, uh, implemented if we want to see a further development um, of, uh, of, the, of the European uh, integration uh, in general. In the same time, in this time framework of next 10 years, the EU has to find the more suitable ways to address the deficiency within the member states who are falling behind with regards to respect of the founding rules, values, and standards of the, of the European Union. In these times when uh, some of the countries are facing uh, sanctions uh, based on the, the fact that they are not respecting the, the founding values and, and the rules, it is very easy for the populist in the region to say, why should I change when within the EU, there are countries which are behaving in the same, same way. So um, this is a joint, joint effort that we need to, to work on it both from within the EU and obviously to provide the citizens of the candidate, state, uh, candidate countries uh, 
additional tool, especially for the civil society organization to say, how do you expect to join the EU if you do not respect the major democratic principles and values upon which the EU has been, has been founded? And this especially goes to the address of Serbian government at this, uh, at this stage. In this time frame of 2030, the candidate countries will have enough time to address both bilateral issues and those internal difficult, difficult reforms that needs to be uh, addressed. But in order to be uh, uh, efficient, it needs to be a common agenda, not the agenda for the candidates, but it needs to be a part of the common European agenda or agenda for the integration uh, of, um, uh, of Europe. Um, I will finish by stating what is obvious. Next year, we are going to mark 20th anniversary of Thessaloniki summit. And I think it's a perfect uh, occasion to renew the vows that we took 20 years ago, even in the most uh, uh, harmonious marriages, sometimes you need to renew the vows. And um, it is obvious that after 20 years and after a lot of, a lot of talks, a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, sometimes hot air, uh, we need to, to sign something together and to say, this is a time to, to, to change. This is a time to really accept the obligations on both sides uh, and to become more honest and more dedicated and accountable for the obligations that, uh, that, we, that we take for the benefit of both and the common European, European uh, future. I'll stop here. Thank you, Serge. And I'll turn to Simonito now. Uh, your view on uh, your take on the scenarios and whether you think that the opening of accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia will give uh, the enlar enlargement a new impetus. Thanks. Thank you, Visa. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Um, especially because I've done a lot of work with NSI uh, in Mitrovica teaching at their school. So it's very much a pleasure to be now actually in uh, uh, Pristina on uh, their event as well. Um, yes, we, Macedonia was subtly uh, mentioned. Um, the big, and Serjan mentioned the word that I wrote even before he started. My big question um, as uh, someone who studied uh, European affairs for a long time, who studied the enlargement of the 2004 and 2007 um, example, uh, and uh, as someone who studied European studies, unfortunately, between 2004 and 2000, 2000 and 2004. So this is my disclaimer. I'm a, an ardent European. Now I'm a bit more realist, a bit disappointed, but I think that's my original bias. I, my, uh, I think that uh, a lot of the remarks that were made here go to our mental reference of the 2004 and 2007 enlargement. And I'm not sure that we've, we've uh, departed from that example enough to be able to uh, reflect on other scenarios. Because what we heard here are also some uh, attempts possibly uh, at reinventing that wheel with um, some additions with a focus on the political uh, Will, but I also think that uh, together with the political will and the emotional messaging, a machinery stands behind the enlargement process, an administrative machinery stands behind it. I think that that was something that we did probably did not mention, and that could be my added value to this um, to this uh, discussion, uh, because uh, what we've experienced these now it has been nine, eight months since the beginning of this year has been rather of a roller coaster. And probably we'll need a bit of a historical distance to actually assess what happened in February, what happened uh, in the case of uh, North Macedonia and Albania in June and July, and whether uh, this is actually a turning point or going back to your second question, whether this will actually make a difference, I'm not so sure. I mean, the, the sense in North Macedonia was a bit of celebration, but a bit of anticlimactic uh, feeling to be to be to, in all uh, fairness. Uh, the start of the accession negotiations, uh, probably after um, 13 years of the first recommendation to start the accession negotiations in 2009, did feel to many people too little as too little and too late. I mean, I wrote in a couple of blogs a couple of years ago that the 
unfortunately, the EU in our case felt as the boy who cried wolf. And uh, this, is the, this is the prophecy that I did really disliked in July, because now we are in a situation in which the EU actually is co constantly convincing us, yes, the accession negotiations have started. And then the, 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 the journalists keep asking me, but have they actually? Uh, and uh, it, this question is very valid because they might end just as soon as they have provisionally opened or however you want to call them in the in the technical uh, negotiations in the technical aspect so we're very wary of this of these discussions at the moment because they also fuel the the any they fuel uh public discontent they fuel this lack of trust which uh uh odetta mentioned before and uh, we are really uh, hoping that uh, be, um, beyond the emotional messaging, there will be real political will, which I'm really not seeing still a real political desire in all member states beyond the one that we heard here possibly to move with the process. And if there is political will, then a signal needs to be given to the administrative side of the European Union enlargement. This has been traditionally the European Commission. We still, from our side, as someone who's worked on this, we still expect this to be the European uh, Commission, but we feel that the wheel needs to be much more strongly turned from that from uh, that side. I am saying this uh, also because um, I was once in a previous life, not for a negligible period of my life, a civil servant in uh, the Macedonian government. And the last meaningful process, I will still argue that happened with the EU enlargement process was the visa liberalization or the visa liberalization discussions, which unfortunately took the turn that they did here. And uh, uh, I think that this was probably the one meaningful uh, exercise when the EU, based on that model of the 2004 and 2007, did put forward specific benchmarks and then did deliver to the to the to the countries of uh, the region. So um, the big question that all of us had with the start of the accession negotiations, and this might be probably a good reflection for the scenarios, is if we are entering a process that's comparable to what was the case in Serbia and Montenegro with the length of the and the, the dynamic of that process, that then what is it that we actually pushed for? I mean, this is a question mark that we had in our heads in 2016, in the midst of the biggest political crisis in Macedonia, when we, I have been uh, voicing out the demand for the start of the accession negotiations, which is a huge step. But then if you're entering a never ending process, then uh, you really wonder what were you actually uh, asking for? Or if the accession negotiations, um, if Macedonia, comparable to Serbia and Montenegro, without the start of the accession negotiations is just as well aligned or even better in some areas with the EU a key, what do the accession negotiations make, make a difference? I mean, um, this is a question mark that we, we really uh, have above our heads uh, often. And I think this is a very important example for the other countries that are waiting uh, uh, in the line such as, uh, such as Bosnia uh, and Kosovo. Uh, thus, if we reflect on the scenarios, we wonder which of these scenarios can actually make a difference. Uh, QMV for sure can make a difference, but going back from my original sin of my of being a, someone who studied European integration, I'm very wary if I will see it in my lifetime. And to be honest, I mean, it's a very blunt answer, but this is something that we also discussed in 2004. This is something that goes back to the question marks of the bigger enlargement process. And I think it's good that it is on the table. It's unfortunate that it was brought to the table also on our uh, on an example that feels very closely to me. Uh, that is usually the example that's being given uh, is to the bilateral uh, abuse of the process. But um, uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, in this huge economic uh, crisis, in this huge energy crisis, whether this will be the, the, the real discussion on the table, at least for the next, uh, maybe not a decade, by five years. Then again, we were also told that Europe is a project of crisis. So they, they, one might be surprised, but uh, maybe we've become a bit too realist uh, in, this, uh, in this sense. I assume that Sturgeon will talk on the stage the accession later in the, in the questions because they have been an ardent supporter of the and the, uh, the creator of the of the model. But I would be very in um, in linking that to the European political community. I think it's a it's a different discussion that probably bears uh, uh, very much a um, 
um, and a separate uh, assessment of what actually uh, are the, the nuances uh, of such of the process itself. I would like to bring, uh, though, uh, a last uh, point in terms of the um, administrative side and uh, the, the legal dimension of the accession process. And it's something that a lot of the countries in the region have been neglecting, and these are the stabilization and association agreements. And I mention it here, especially in Kosovo, because I don't think we make this is a country that has it, and I don't think we make the full use in the region on our side of what the stabilization and association agreements offer. I think we bear a responsibility, our administrations primarily, to push the EU member states to provide a lot of the rights and a lot of the um, obligations that they have under these agreements that we are not using uh, uh, extensively, which actually the countries of the Eastern Partnership, in, in all of their fairness, did better than, than we did because of their lack of the accession uh, perspective as such. They did focus on what they had on the table uh, in terms of their uh, DCFTAs. Um, Ukraine and Moldova being in the pile of the uh, con candidate countries, I think, will create a pressure on the European Commission to actually deal with these issues more strategically. I think they can't be put to the side, uh, but how, for how long will this uh, will it take for the administrative uh, tools to be uh, awakened? That's uh, that's a different uh, question uh, on uh, uh, that we are yet to uh, see. I think I'll end here for the intro and then looking forward to questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll turn back to you, Sergeon, before I give the floor to Odetta. You, you said uh, in your opening remarks that we have to be accountable, we have to be more dedicated and honest. And I think that's very important. So let us be honest for a moment, what is happening? So uh, I'm using Serbia as an example here. Uh, it's, a, it's perceived as the front runner of the EU integration alongside Montenegro. But today when war is back uh, in Europe, Serbia, with the exception of Belarus, is the only country that hasn't imposed any round of sanctions. Um, against Russia. Um, it's the only country in the region that is not aligning with the European foreign policy, even though it's required by the integration stages. Uh, the pride parade is being canceled. The government is not taking any responsibility, B people being attacked. Uh, the media freedom is deteriorating according to all international indexes and reports. So with all these challenges in mind, uh, where, where is Serbia heading uh, towards? What is your view? Do you think that it has something has to change here? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, at this stage, and this is something that I'm uh, speaking publicly uh, in Serbia as well, Serbia do not fulfill the, 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 the elementary Copenhagen criteria for the accession to the EU. There is a lot of question marks with regards to respect of uh, minority rights, with respect to the independence of judiciary, with re respect of freedom of um, uh, media. Freedom of, uh, of speech is sometimes uh, under threat uh, uh, because of the the, uh, the 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 media capture scene that we are experiencing. So Serbia at this stage is uh, at a much lower level of fulfillment of the the elementary Copenhagen criteria than it was in uh, 2014 when we started the EU accession talks. But this is not exclusively due to the internal politics. It is due to the, uh, the lack of European perspective for the country. And uh, the, the thing that uh, Serbia shows the best is the, that the, the transformative power of the enlargement process is not delivering. There is a serious issue with regards um, the lack of condemnation of uh, some phenomena happening in, in Serbia on behalf of the EU officials. It is obviously obvious sort of a, a coexistence of lack of interest for integration on, on the both sides. The EU was not interested in the past couple of years on the enlargement of the EU that was recognized in Serbia, not only in Serbia, I would say in some other countries of the region as well. And uh, thus there was no this pushing power that would support pooling efforts, or rather pooling power that would facilitate the pushing efforts from within, uh, making pressure on the government to change certain, certain politics. And unfortunately, Serbia at this stage is a poster child of how 
enlargement process in given circumstances is not delivering this transformation that, that was required. And um, we, together with our colleagues from the Center for European Policy Studies in, in Brussels, we basically proposed how to move this uh, um, uh, in a very concrete way, how to move uh, enlargement policy forward by introducing these stages of the EU, EU accession. The stages are nothing more but the checks and balances that would require from the candidates to be accountable throughout the process. Those who are more accountable, those who are more uh, successful in, the, in delivering what are the requirements of the EU membership will get stronger incentives, both in a financial sense, but also uh, with regards to participation in the work of the, of the EU institutions. And that would send a message to the public don't underestimate the power of public, to public to, to, to see that some benefits of the EU accession process are within the reach in an early phase, in an early stage of the EU, EU accession. Um, and um, obviously the whole model was based on, uh, on, on the assumption that there is a lack of confidence, that there is a lack of trust between the, the two sides, between the candidate countries and the member states. The member states lost their, their faith that uh, the, the candidate country, con countries can change in this process, based, among the others, on the example of Serbia. While, uh, as I said, the candidates saw that this is an open-ended process with no guarantees that there will be price at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, the, the road. And thus, uh, the both sides lost, uh, lost the, the credibility. And this is why... Uh, we propose this uh, stage accession model as something, something that can uh, re, re energize the whole, whole process and provide guarantees on both sides that yes, the, the, uh, the, the accession and the membership is at the end of the road. And yes, these countries will change due to these checks and balances which are introduced uh, early, uh, early in the process. It would enable also a, a healthy competition within the region, something that, uh, that um, uh, uh, was mentioned before, uh, and that was present in the visa liberalization negotiations, where uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, but even Bosnia and Herzegovina at the end realized that they can catch up with the rest of the region uh, if they uh, if if they join the region in the efforts and uh, uh, compete in a very healthy uh, healthy uh, basis, so there is a way, uh, the, but uh, the will is still I would say missing on both sides. Thank you, Sir John. Back uh, on that note of the power of the public checks and balances, media undoubtedly uh, plays an important role on this, and uh, I'd like to turn to Odetta. Uh, according to the uh, Reporters Without Borders, uh, their World Press Media Index in just one year from 2021 to 2022, Albania dropped 20 places. Um, so my question to you, do you think that even though this long process has, be has begun, do you think that the government, the, uh, the Albanian country is, is moving into the authoritarian direction? And how does this affect uh, Albanian's, EU, Albania's EU integration aspirations? Okay. Um I haven't seen that specific uh, that specific data. Um, I think uh, if we take in consideration 2020, 2022, there are developments which are across uh, the region and across Europe, and it have well first to do with the pandemics, and second to do I think if we speak of the current moment also of the of the war in Ukraine, and I think a third development is the revolution of social media and digitalization. And uh, if we speak, if we take Albanian case specifically, what we see uh, is, I would say, a very vibrant uh, debate in the media. Uh, whoever lives in Albania can attest to that. Whoever follows the Albanian media can attest to that. Uh, and I think that sets Albania apart. In fact, even from a number of countries in the region, uh, to link it to your first question, I think. And uh, you can hear everything in the media to the extent that actually it becomes very difficult to find the truth. And I think one of the most contested initiatives 
uh, that the government has uh, recently taken, since 2020, in fact, and has triggered debate had to do with the regulation of, uh, of the social media, what they call the portals. And that is the only initiative which has been uh, under discussion also with the European delegation, with the EU, and it's still in the process of, uh, of finalization of how that regulation can actually regulate that area without uh, uh, without limiting the rights of, of the media and uh, the, without weakening freedom of speech. Uh, I think if we take into consideration as we are speaking, as we are in a panel on EU accession, uh, I think if we refer to the reports of EU Commission, uh, in terms of preparedness, Albania is doing very well. Uh, also comparatively, as I said, with other countries in the media uh, freedom uh, section. Uh, so I think when we speak about one country, it's important also to have in mind the broader context and those three developments uh, that I said, of course, that the, in the wake of the pandemics, in the context of the conflict, when you have so many contesting narratives, when, of course, we're living amidst uh, an outburst of, of fake news and, and of this uh, fake of... of uh, um, what I call the, the new phenomenon of deep fake, which is, is quite quite recent even for those who study uh, the, the area. Um, and of course, of the outburst of the portals and social media, which makes the traditional media very, very different and has trans transformed radically the public sphere. So I need to check the data that you referred to, but I think linking it to the current debate about the EU accession, I think that's one of the areas where Albania is faring quite well, and it's not one of the areas where it's it's a, it's a of course it's an area we 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 need to keep into constant attention. It's it's part of the Copenhagen criteria. It's part of our other political criteria, um, but it's not one of the areas that you could think that you no know, or one can conclude uh, that there are any backsliding in, in the case. Of Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn to Simonita now. You, you mentioned that um, uh, the uh, opening of negotiation chapters uh, has created this anti-climatic <laughs> wave or wasn't perceived very well, maybe with mixed feelings uh, from the population. So I'd like to ask you, do you see a risk for increased right-wing populism or nationalism, considering how the dispute with Bulgaria was handled? Just uh, for the sake of clarity, it's not it's not opening of chapters. We are in the screening phase together with uh, yeah for, with uh, um, uh, together with Albania in the process. And the opening, the actual opening, will come just after the constitutional changes are made, uh, and when the constitutional changes in uh, North Macedonia are made. So this is a very uh, it's uh, a minor detail, but that's the detail that makes it anticlimactic, uh, I think. Uh, so it's it's fair enough to to emphasize it. Um, right wing uh, populism. I think the biggest risk uh, that uh, that we see um, and that I see is the delegitimization of the European idea. That's the ring, the risk that uh, we've encountered for a very for a decade now, and it was even uh, during the Greek veto, it was even miraculous as to how we managed to maintain the dedication to the European accession, both among the population but also uh, among the uh, public. Unfortunately, we have since the last elections, we have a uh, minor two uh, party two represented in parliament of two members who are anti-NATO and anti-EU uh, oriented. They And this is a first in the Macedonian context. They've uh, managed also to grasp a lot of attention at the local elections. And uh, they also capitalize on the discontent of the youth. And this is a, this is a very specific, this is a very risky uh, path. Uh, but uh, putting aside this specific actor, the broader uh, question that uh, bears an effect and bears negative consequences of, on many of us that uh, appear in the media and contribute to the public discussion on, uh, on the European uh, agenda is how to actually explain some of the steps that were taken by uh, the European uh, Union um, and some of the 
uh, trends that also Sergeant reflected on in terms of the democratic backsliding in the EU itself, in order to support the democratic transformation of Macedonia, to create an argument of uh, uh, the value of the goal of European uh, accession in the, the type of process that we have had, which lasts already a decade and is likely to last for uh, another one. Uh, in within a human lifetime, this is likely impossible. I mean, this, this is the question that we have really uh, we've been uh, faced over the over the summer in July, because for many of us, July and the way that the European uh, the some of the topics related to the Bulgarian dispute were inserted in our negotiating framework, had created a, a bigger, even bigger sense of not even injustice, but a diversion from the possibly from European values. This. Um, was a risky path to take. We warned many of the people that deal with European integration, also in the EU member states, warned that this might is likely not the optimal path to take. Uh, the sense of urgency over the Ukraine uh, war uh, and the granting of the candidate status to the countries from the Euro Eastern Partnership also created pressure to actually de deliver on Albania and North Macedonia. Um, the deal has been made. We have started the accession negotiations in the given circumstances, but long term, actually, the sustainability of the process uh, will depend on the behavior of each and every government in North Macedonia and Bulgaria, which was the case always. But in these circumstances, we have created a higher risk of abuse of these completely non-essential issues for the EU accession process, both for the nationalists in North Macedonia, but also for the nationalists in uh, Bulgaria. I would like, to, I would re, I'm really hoping that we will see a scenario in which this issue will not be misused in, uh, in the future, but it is a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a fruit that just hanging there and we'll see who will actually dare to pick it up. Uh, Sir John, uh, we'll, um... There's a general consensus that neither Serbia or Kosovo is going to uh, be fully integrated into the EU without resolving their uh, their dispute. So uh, in the last couple of months, uh, we've seen a surge of uh, new envoys to the region, uh, the US envoy Escobar, the German envoy uh, Saracin uh, Lychak uh, from the EU, and uh, even recently the, uh, the Greek ambassador to Hungary, uh, Gramata was appointed as uh, the Greek special envoy to the region. Uh, in the last couple of me weeks, we've seen articles that the French government and the German government uh, have two new uh, um, advisors on, on, on the region, on specifically focusing on the kosovo Serbia dialogue. Uh, my question to you is, do you think that all these new envoys and advisors are creating expectations to, to the region? and? If they do not deliver, let's say in the next two years, if nothing uh, happens, do you think that it will we will go back to uh, potential tensions or escalation, even verbally, <laughs> yeah, between the, the parties involved? Thanks. Well, I, I think that nobody living in this region has the luxury of uh, of losing yet another opportunity to to miss the opportunity to 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 get something. Uh, Right. Last night I discussed with uh, with Nikola Dimitrov uh, the situation in the region, and uh, we came to a conclusion that our generation failed. We have a kids now in the the university, uh, and maybe it's their time to take over uh, some processes uh, in in our societies. Uh, but politicians like Nikola can look themselves in the mirror and say, "Listen, I, I tried and I delivered." Um, and in general, when you when you think about these historical agreements and situations, um, and the, the responsibility of politicians, you can detect two 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 sorts of politicians: ones who recognize the problem and go straight to it in order to resolve it, uh, and the others who recognize the problem and use it to stay in power. And this is as simple as that. Now, I don't want to be intellectually dishonest and say that Kosovo, Serbia issue is easy to resolve. It's not, it's different, it's difficult, it's complex, it's emotional, it's, um, the ad identities are at questions and these are very difficult questions to resolve. Um, and I don't think that, that we are capable of resolving and this is to the detriment of, of us, 
we're thinking about how to resolve it. I don't think that we have a capacity to resolve it by ourselves. Thus, uh, the latest surge of, of new advisors uh, to the process, I would say, are welcome. And obviously, the letter sent by President Macron and uh, Chancellor Schultz at the beginning of uh, September are actually starting a new phase in uh, the, uh, the normalization uh, uh, dialogue. Whether they're, they're going to successful or not, I'm not sure. There is another part, and you mentioned um, uh, Deputy State Secretary Escobar. The US is a shareholder in this process. Uh, one should not neglect the fact that uh, in 2023, next year, the Biden administration will lose part of its dedication to the foreign policy and start focusing on re-election or electoral campaign. So I think the next, next, well, less than a year will be crucial to pave the way, way uh, to pave the way for, for some sort of a agreement between uh, Kosovo, uh, Kosovo and Serbia. Mind you, uh, the resolution will require compromise. Uh, the resolution will require democratic legitimacy of the, of the solution, meaning that societies needs to accept the, the, the agreement between uh, the negotiators. Uh, because this is the only way through the engagement of the, the public to create a, a I would say a, a sort of a sustainable social environment that that can sustain uh, the, the the implementation of the agreement which is going to be um, introduced for that we also need our Schumanns and our Adenauers um, and uh, you know, leaders who are led by hope about leaders who are, who are led by the vision of a common future. Uh, the leaders maybe who will start talking about regional um, integration and regional integration or rather integration of the region to the EU. Uh, the, re the leaders who would start talking about uh, a common accession of the whole region to the EU. This, this opens a new conversation on whether we're going to join the EU one by one, which I start to doubt, or as a block, as uh, Labinot was, was mentioning in his presentation. These are very difficult conversation ahead of us. And as I said, it would be a very intellectually dishonest to say that we have a, at this stage answers to all these, these questions. But we, when, we, when you have a question, uh, then it's a perfect, uh, perfect time for, for conversation. So yeah, let's hope that things are going to move uh, forward. Um, thank you. Uh, not sure if we have uh, Labinot uh, uh, on Zoom. Uh, before I open the floor to the audience, I'd like to ask Labinot if he can, uh, maybe if he has anything to add for, uh, on the discussions, or if not, maybe we can proceed with the questions from the audience. Um, so please, anyone, if you have comments or questions, um, please go ahead. So just so you know that I'm still here, I don't know if you can still hear me. Yeah, we missed you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did listen attentively to, to, to all the presentations uh, by the panelists and uh, I just wanna say that uh, I really enjoyed uh, this, uh, this talk. Thank you so much for, to everyone who reflected on some of the points that I put, put out there. I mean, the idea was, uh, of course, uh, not to try and put the best and the, and the right way to go ahead. It's just to tease out a little bit the conversation. And that's exactly what happened here uh, to anything that we write or we, we, the ideas that we present, uh, which in any case are not completely original. Um, there is always uh, this part where they meet the practitioners, people who are working in the field, and they add a dose of reality to, 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 to those. Uh, so I think that I particularly enjoyed. I mean, uh, uh, one thing though I would like to say is that I feel that the conversation has gone a little bit from being strictly academic, uh, especially when it comes from the region, uh, as to what are the best ways for the countries to be able to move ahead in their European integration path to a little bit more 
tangible and maybe acceptable. I mean, I just was, was mentioning uh, when some of the papers were coming out of the region that advocating uh, this, uh, for example, the move on uh, qualified majority voting on enlargement questions, it, uh, it really seemed uh, like, a, like a, a paper in the university uh, um, and strictly academic. But right now we're having actually that conversation in Brussels by the member states. It, it's, it's part of the agenda. Questionable whether something will really come out of it uh, or when it will come out but at least it's happening, it's a little bit more. So uh, I would just like to add, uh, end my, my uh, intervention here with, I saw and I heard quite a lot of hopeful messages in, in this panel, and I think uh, that's very encouraging. Thank you, Lavinat, appreciate it. Uh, okay, now um, it's time for the audience. Do we have a brave one? <laughs> Damir, here, please. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Damir Marusic from the Atlantic Council. A question, um, I, I feel like uh, the discussion about the European political community has, uh, um, I, not that you've glossed over it, but I, I feel like you've, you've been uh, uh, not worried enough about it as, a, as an alternative. I mean, I think this is one of the, the, the questions that's hanging in the air about, uh, you know, you talk about the importance of coming together, of the Europeans coming together with a, a common vision. But the, uh, the I think there is a, a, a real worry that the political will is not there and the European political community is actually seen by some member states as uh, a real alternative. Uh, that's not just a 10 year frame, but a longer frame. So I would, I would love to hear you actually reflect about that and any insights, uh, perhaps Odetta, from you know talking to partners about what this actually looks like politically among European partners and how this is developing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Damir. Yes, this is one of the main themes these days, isn't it? Particularly among Europeans, uh, how we can relaunch this idea of political community. And uh, Albania has supported it in good faith. And I think the two arguments why we have support is A, that we need more political engagement and platforms to interact with the Europeans. And in fact, going back to regional cooperation and the messages of Mr. Sarazin today, Berlin process was the first platform where we actually could sit and have real conversation at the same table with the Europeans, Western Balkans with the EU. You had Gumnish style meetings, the MFAs on the sides of other of the councils, but not quite a platform for that. So the first argument why we supported the idea of the EPC when it first came out, and it was sort of articulated particularly from the French, uh, by the French, uh, was this, to have that platform to engage. And this became even more urgent in the current context of Ukraine. When we're speaking about energy and food security, uh, we're still working with bilaterally with key partners within the European Union. Eh? We have key member states we work very closely with, they have been on our side, but then we can see that these challenges require pan-European responses. And it's not just about the EU and the Western Balkans, it's European. And that includes and goes further actually than just the Western Balkans. Of course, as the Eastern Partnership countries is Turkey as an important security actor, in the region, not as an external, but as an, an important actor. And this is a conversation which needs to take place now in this urgent, with this, uh, uh, given the urgency of, 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 the, of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, the second reason that, uh, that we supported this, we see it al also as a platform to discuss our future, not just the present to start this as a socializing, so to speak, exercise. We need to start now behaving as European member states, as a future members. And I think in that regard, it's also important. We had in July, um, okay, we had the first council, which was a disaster because we came back empty handed, of course we didn't expect much. And then two weeks after that, we had the opening of accession uh, negotiations. 
And I remember I was there in Brussels in the first, uh, the first meeting when nothing much was expected, but was a bit of a suspense whether, you know, it will be a last minute decision that very few of us expected anyway. But I think it was very important. And that was a message we also got through public opinion, through the civil society and those who know the, and have studied uh, European uh, affairs for many years. It's important to be there and to convey the message of what we want. And this is what I was trying to say at the beginning of my presentation, is that this conversation needs to be meaningful. We are having two very different debates on unqualified majority voting, the future of Europe. And it seems like this is not taking into consideration what the region needs. The region needs what we're actually going back to the slogan of the 90s, to become like Europe. And this won't start when we become members. You know, it's a conversation that needs to start, well, it needs to start yesterday. So this is how we see it as an opportunity. Now, speaking of the risks of it, and we had conversations also within us, among us in the region, I think we have been at different wavelengths, even with our uh, neighbors and, and, and partners in the region about this, uh, is that it needn't, it shouldn't actually replace the accession process. That is another track and it should go parallel to it. Huh? Uh, and it shouldn't become a replacement of that. And from all that I see already now ahead of the first meeting of the, of the EPC in Prague, I don't see the prospects of that becoming a platform with a structured, which, which has a structure and which will deliver, you know, which, which will deliver what Sergeant said our objective to have a sort of a, a platform or a program, a pan-European program. I don't see that have, that sh taking place yet or being shaped. So that's why I'm a bit realistic, uh, realistic about this. We have more urgent needs. I think we have more realist. We need to have also realistic expectations of what, what that can deliver. And going back to the discussions about Europe and about uh, having sort of a, this you know, strategic autonomy, sort of more strategic presence in the global stage. Um, these debates go back for everyone who studied the EU since the, since the early 50s, even before the Treaty of Rome, since the, you know, from the founding day moment of the, of the steel and coal community. And very few of those ideas came into fruition. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point, going back to the point of patriotism of, of Agon, I think we need to be realistic and a bit assertive and confident about what we can give, how we can contribute to European security and what we need as a region now. Sir John, what, would you like to say something? I, I just wanted to add, sure. I, I agree with, the, with the that, obviously. Um, I, I don't think that uh, Western Balkan six are in position to be openly against that kind of a uh, 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 proposal. The problem is that um, it's very difficult to define the proposal itself. At the speech at the Sorbonne, Serbon, or was it in Strasbourg? I forgot. Strasbourg, yeah. Yeah. President Macron said we need a new organization. Now nobody's mentioning organization. They're speaking about platform, which is much more realistic, obviously. Um, in the, the French non paper about the EPC, there are more references on what EPC is not rather than what EPC is. Uh, which is very, very confusing. Uh, so in that sense, as I said, we are not in position to say no, but we need to be very, very careful to make sure and to reiterate by, the, by our representatives at this conference in Prague that none of the six is assuming that this is some kind of a, uh, a replacement for the EU membership of the, the Western Balkan countries. The second point, I must say that some of the leaders in the region, including one of the country that I'm coming from, will use this opportunity as a source of international legitimization again. Um, again, going back to the original speech, there was a iteration, rather reference to the uh, coalition of democracies and coalition of countries that share common foreign security goals. Now, if you go, if you analyze the, the broader Euro European picture from that perspective, 
there is a serious question mark whether some EU member states fulfill these criteria and whether all the candidates fulfill these criteria and whether they will have uh, the right to sit around the table of such a, such a, such a meeting. So it is obvious that from a, a grandiose political idea, it has deflated. And uh, I'm afraid that this is going to be yet another traveling talk show um, that might have uh, 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 certain, certain benefits. Uh, but I, I don't think that it can replace the nature, the transformative nature that enlargement brings to, to the countries like uh, Ukraine, Moldova, or the Western Balkan states. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions from the audience. Uh, Yelan, could you please go ahead first? And then the gentleman uh, in the back. So we can collect both questions and maybe we can try and answer both of them. Sure. It's not working. Okay. Um, thank you so much. This was an inspiring panel. I'd like uh, the panel perhaps to follow up on something that Simonida has mentioned, and that's the question of Ukraine and Moldova, which can't be put aside. So I was wondering to what extent can we talk about the reform of the enlargement process without discussing the European perspectives of Ukraine and Moldova? And also, what will these discussions or bringing these countries in the debate, what will it mean for the Western Balkans? So perhaps uh, Labinot, but also Sergeant Simonida and Odetta, if you could just reflect on that, it would be wonderful. Thank you. We will uh, get the other question as well, and then we'll we'll, we'll answer both. Well, Jan Farfel, uh, European Studies Center, University of Oxford. Uh, I would like to tap on the external influences as well. So uh, thank you for the inter interesting discussion and for this publication. And I'm just wondering about this huge caption at the introduction, which states that the scenarios foresee no role for Russia and China in eventual peace process. So obviously, when, it, when we think about the roles, we would like to see it in a positive dimension, but obviously roles can be also disruptive. So I was wondering whether this statement is a logical conclusion of your discussions for seeing no disruptive potential for Russia and China, or is it a clearly politi political aspiration for the future? Thank you. I guess uh, Labinot or Simonida can take the first one and uh, the second one, Sergeant or Odetta. Uh, Labina, would you like to go ahead first? I'll, I'll just uh, go very quickly. I mean, I've covered this uh, this topic in the in the paper, which I hope uh, uh, can be read there. But uh, basically, like the the way that I've addressed it is that um, uh, the EU accession of Ukraine and Moldova in the current context is absolutely important and urgent and uh, and necessary. Now, the argument is that this provides just an extra argument in, in terms of the EU enlargement process of the Western Balkans. It doesn't compete with it. It doesn't do anything that uh, could have a negative impact. It's in fact reinforcing even further the argument that the Western Balkans needs to be part of the European Union. Uh, that's in my view. Uh, going uh, just a, a, another step is that of course, before this conflict, we've had uh, a lot of conversations in the EU about how much certain EU member states are in, 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 in effect uh, equal uh, when it comes to a number of European values and standards and so on. But uh, one thing that, uh, that this conflict, I think, has, uh, has brought back is, uh, is just uh, thinking about these uh, new member states in the context of the conflict of the war in uh, in Ukraine, is just imagine them being on the outside. So I think this is something that we we need to to to, to have in mind as well. Thank you, Swanita. Very quickly, please uh, on the first one. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Ukraine and Moldova. That's why I mentioned the administrative uh, engine. To be honest, because I'm still not seeing that there are preparations in the administrative structures of the European Union to actually deal with this new, new reality. We are probably gonna see the first signs in October when the progress report, when the not progress reports, reports on the countries are published. 
uh, to see how this will uh, unravel. But uh, going back to some to where I started, I think that we need to see a conscious effort in strengthening the structures of uh, the enlargement process at the EU side to actually deliver on the transformative role that the commission should have with the institutions in these countries. Now, I'm also very, uh, one of the things that you said very quickly, I'm gonna take another two minutes. One of the things that we should have mentioned uh, previously in the scenarios that left uh, unsaid from my notes is actually that Ukraine has been much more um, quick to uh, actually subscribe to the idea of entrance to the single market beforehand. The entry to the single market was also one of the scenarios uh, that has been circulated and possibly might uh, have a, uh, possibly should have been mentioned in, in our discussion. And the, because from what I know, President Zelensky and both the president of the commission have been uh, discussing this issue publicly of Ukraine's potential accession first to the single market, which is something that was left to the side from our, uh, that was a bit of a peripheral discussion in our focus on the EU accession. I'm not a supporter of the idea for the region, but we have to keep in mind that this is one of the, that Ukraine might have a separate path in this, uh, in this uh, respect, uh, potentially. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, who would like to take the second one, Serjan or Odetta? Uh, yeah, sure. About the objectives, yes. Um, no, I think the conflict and the present crisis in Ukraine has shown that the region is more vulnerable to, to the presence of, uh, of third actors. And you mentioned Russia and China as the usual suspects. We just only recently had a very uh, serious and uh, um, uh, very, I think, thorough because it touched all branches of the administration cyber uh, attack in Albania by another country. Uh, so I think we need to be cautious uh, about uh, the presence of uh, of third of third powers in the region. And with regard to Russia, is not Albania is in a in different position from other countries in the region because. Uh, not much of a political influence or presence or even ideational or cultural presence. But it is obvious that, and it became obvious in the recent years that any failure or delay in relation to the EU accession process would be a gain for Russia. So Russia is not interested in democracy, in, 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 in sustaining the model of the values and norms that EU represents. So I think that is important to, to, to emphasize in the case of Albania in particular. Uh, but I would also like to make another comment with regard to third actors and the EU in particular. Um, I mentioned trust in the beginning of my presentation and how uh, much precious time we lost uh, yes. since 2018 onward. But there was also, I think, a juncture moment to the pandemics in 2020 in a moment which lasted only a few uncertain months, we call the, the vaccine crisis, but it really shook the trust among uh, the countries, the public opinion in the Western Balkans, like, are we part of the EU or not? Are we going to find common solutions or the common solutions that European are going to find? Are they going to include us? So that was a very existential question and, uh, you know, very, uh, how to say, prevailing mood of uncertainty in, in the region. And in that particular moment, um, it's unfortunate to mention, but then we relied on other actors. So for all the talk about, you know, sort of the European project, the EU accession process being a sort of a deterrence, uh, a deterrent to the presence of other actors in the region, these particular moments of crisis are very important to show who's first there, and who is on our side. And I think the Europeans eventually got the lesson and learned that lesson. I hope that lesson stays with Europeans. It's not something that is short term. And then I think we'll see whether that lesson will translate also in the context of Ukraine and in the wake of the conflict. And I hope you know we're, we'll be speaking about the post-conflict very soon, the post-war. But I think that lesson needs to stay that it is particularly in those existential junctures that you need the EU and you see where the EU is because for our countries, we are surrounded by the EU. It's not that we feel like we need to go to the, we need to work with the Europeans. We are in Europe. This is, uh, and, and, and it is both emotional, but also I think a pragmatic uh, uh, 
way and an argument of thinking and argument. Thank you, Sir John. If you can say a few words very quickly, and just uh, yeah, uh, maybe telling the audience before you proceed that we have time for only only one final question. I, I saw a hand, but sorry, I'll just give it to Shpatim because he was first. Uh, once Sir John is done with his answer, then we'll give you the the question, and we can we can we can finish the conversation. Please. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be very short because uh, I don't want to repeat what Odetta already mentioned. It is obvious that uh, we are exposed as long as we are outside. And uh, this is why I was referring to a common agenda, common you know, pan-European integration uh, uh, program within which the EU will develop a new strategy of its relationship, especially with China, because with Russia, we know that it's going to be very difficult to establish any sort of a cooperation of foreseeable uh, future. Although not saying that it is not required, we, we are going to require a new new model of cooperation for sure after the the the, the after Russia is defeated in uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, but with China, uh, comparing the two, we have to have a right measure. I mean, obviously Russia is there there to to disrupt as a disruptive force. Um, China is a bit bit different. It has a more strategic interest through the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, where, mind you, even the EU member states are participating uh, um, together with, uh, with, with the candidate countries. Now, saying that there is a difference in the measure of engagement of two global uh, actors, uh, one would simply be naive to, to neglect the fact that uh, the outcome is the same. It is disruptive, regardless of the nature of Chinese presence. The outcome is corrupted elite, is erosion of democratic institutions. Mind you, we haven't mentioned Turkey, which is playing also a very significant role. And uh, sometimes our judicial, judicial, judicial power uh, is under a serious pressure coming from uh, uh, Ankara. Uh, on uh, on certain uh, certain aspects of legal cooperation between uh, between the countries, uh, being a serious investor, obviously they can throw their weight around and influence uh, democratic processes and division of power in uh, in in our countries. So this disruptive uh, disruptive nature of the engagement of the big powers in the region should not be neglected, but should be dealt within the common pan European. Uh, program of how to integrate and how to deal with these issues. And this is why I was saying that these up to 10 years from now are sufficient enough to create a, a, a really a common approach of how to deal with these issues. When the EU is developing its China strategy, the Western Balkan countries and the new candidates needs to be part of that, needs to be a, on board, because as Odetta said, not to repeat some mistakes that occurred in, in a critical moment of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pandemic. Um, when discussing a European security compass, the Western Balkans needs to be on board. When discussing critical infrastructure of the EU for the next 20 years, Western Balkans needs to be there. Digital, energy, transport, everything. It's, it's our critical infrastructure. It's not Serbian, it's not Albanian, but it's, it's a common. Sorry, I think you know, no, short. it's fine. You're just running out of time. And unfortunately, we're out of time. So maybe you can ask the questions during the coffee break. And uh, with that in mind, thank you, Labinot, for joining us uh, virtually and for presenting the paper. Thank you, Odetta, uh, Simonida, and Serjan for taking the time to uh, present your uh, remarks and taking the time to answer all of our questions. So uh, we have a short coffee break, a 15 minute coffee break. The next session starts at 1130. Thank you. Thank you.